The Jerry Pal Podcast is brought to you by Archstone Foundation, preparing society and meeting the needs of an aging population. And now, here are your hosts. Welcome to the Jerry Pal Podcast. This is Eric Guadero. This is Alex Smith. And Alex, who do we have with us today? Today, we are honored to be joined by Bob Trug, who is the Francis Gleason Lee Endowed Professor of Legal Medicine and the Director of the Center for Bioethics at Harvard Medical School. I believe that he is the first pediatrician we have had on the Geriatrics and Palliative Care podcast. (laughs) Welcome to the podcast, Bob. Happy to be here. Uh, Looking forward to it. Yes, I'm I'm not surprised I'm the first pediatrician you've had. And we are also delighted to welcome a guest host, Liz Zhang, who is Assistant Professor of Hospital Medicine at UCSF, as MD, PhD, very interested in ethical issues. Welcome to the Jerry Powell Podcast, Liz. Thank you. Great to be here. And no, we are not switching to a pediatric palliative care podcast. We're going to stay uh, as Jerry Powell. And today we're going to be talking about brain death. Um, we're going to be referring to Bob's recent uh kind of multiple editorials on this subject in JAMA, which we'll have links to on the Jerry Powell podcast um, show notes. But before we get into that subject, we always start off with a song request. Bob, do you have a song request for us? Yes. Uh, well, I, I thought given the, the subject that uh, the Grateful Dead should definitely be the band and uh, Touch of Grey actually has some nice lyrics in it that sort of uh, re- refer to our desire to survive. And uh, so I thought that that might be the the best accompaniment here. Are you a deadhead? Um, you know, yes, I guess I would have to say that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, first concert I ever went to, Grateful Dead. Um, and I was in eighth grade. It was actually, they. Pre- I think this was, may have been their first song uh, they, they, they performed. Uh, that was in Ann Arbor. Yeah. Wonderful. I, wonderful. I first saw them as a, as a student at UCLA in Poly Pavilion, which was our big arena. So that was one of my memories of freshman year of college i have only heard the grateful dead once and it was actually not the grateful dead it was phil lesh at terrapin crossing and marin singing children's songs so i can't (laughs) really speak of the grateful dead they live they they well the the remaining members live where we live now so there's a connect another connection okay here we go are running late Paint by numbers morning sky It looks so phony Dawn is breaking everywhere I Light a candle curse the glare Draw the curtains I don't care Cause it's alright I will get by I will get by I will survive Well done, well done. Thank Alex, you. you really went up on the, the production quality here. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe I'm a little crazy there. <laughs> That's a lot of fun. Thank you for that song selection. <laughs> Alex has all his play toys going on in that song right now. Uh, I do. I do. <laughs> Bob, um, first, uh, very much appreciate having you on this podcast. Um, so we're going to be talking about the subject of brain death, which which is an issue both in geriatrics and palliative care. And for anybody taking the palliative care boards coming up um, in about a month, incredibly important topic for the boards too. You got to know a little bit about this. Bob, how did you get interested in this as a as a topic? Because you've been you've been focused on this for a while. You might say a lot of people say I've been obsessed with this for thirty years. Yeah, um, uh, I I actually remember distinctly I was uh, at uh, Denver Children's Hospital in the intensive care unit, and we had a morning lecture, and um, the speaker that morning was teaching us about brain death, and he. Uh, taught it just like any other medical diagnosis. Like, you know, you, you do these things, you test these certain things, and then you make this diagnosis that the person is dead. Kind of like, you know, you, 
here's the criteria for ARDS. Here's the criteria for acute renal failure. And you memorize it and that's it. And I can remember going home that evening and thinking, now, wait a minute. I mean, why is it so clear that this means that a person is is dead? I mean, they don't look dead. And um, and it, it's just sort of stayed in the back of my mind. And, uh, you know, uh, I would ask you as, you know, as physicians, I mean, most of us are taught brain death that way that here's this test and and then and then the person is dead and i it really was a number of years later before i started to think more deeply about it and started to ask uh, questions as to why yeah it's really fascinating i i feel like in medical school we we don't and in residency training at least in internal medicine we don't spend a lot of time on the topic of death or determining death uh, the very little time even from a medical standpoint talking about cardiopulmonary death um, and how to think about that or even like death certificates. So anything that happens after somebody dies, uh, has, we don't spend a lot of time on. Um, can you describe kind of how did this even come up as a, like where, what's the history of brain death? Where did this yeah, come up the, If you go back to the years uh, following World War II, where uh, advances were made in uh, how to keep people alive with a mechanical ventilator. There were people who were noticing that there were patients who absolutely would have died from a devastating brain injury, except they get put on a ventilator and they end up living for a long period of time. And uh, the first article about this comes from French physicians, and they referred to this state as uh, coma de passe or beyond coma. And there's a beginning of a discussion about whether, even though they're being kept alive on the ventilator, should we consider them to be alive since the brain injury is so devastating? And that was that was how it started. And around that time, so and currently the the way that we're we were diagnosing death is by irreversible cessation of cardiopulmonary function. Right. That was that was the the standard up until that point. Where it really kind of all came to a head was uh, in um, December of 1967. So Christian Bernard uh, performs the first heart transplant in Cape Town. And, um, you know, he, he, he comes out to do the, uh, the press interview after the operation. And uh, one of the journalists says, you know, well, was the donor dead before you took out the heart or, or did you kill the donor when you took out the heart. And uh, Christian Bernard was not prepared for this question. I guess his brother, who was much more articulate than, than he was, you know, sort of managed to fumble his way through it. But um, Henry Beecher, who was an anesthesiologist at Massachusetts General Hospital, recognized that this was a huge career opportunity, that if we're going to advance the field of organ transplantation, it's got to be the case that these patients are considered to be dead before we take out their vital organs because nobody wants to think that we're killing them in order to get their organs. And so he went to the dean of the medical school and he forms this committee at Harvard, the ad hoc committee. And um, they were the ones who, who sort of took that idea of coma de passe and actually proposed that maybe this should be a new way of thinking about death. And then kind of moving forward to now... Um... So JAMA just published this really wonderful, and we'll have links to it on the Jerry Powell website, World Brain Death Project Summary of the Termination of Brain Death and Death by Neurological Criteria, um, which has probably the most amount of supplemental content I've, I've ever seen before. <laughs> 17 different supplementals, um, which are all incredibly fascinating to read. Why this now? Why, why try um, to have this consensus statement and recommendations about what uh, brain death and death by neurological criteria. Did um, we resolve it 30 years ago? <laughs> <laughs> hardly. Uh, well, I mean, I say hardly. I think, um, you know, you mentioned that people are going to be taking their boards. I would say, don't listen to what I'm saying in terms of taking your boards, because my, my views about this are not the mainstream views. Um, but, but I hope to convince you that, they're, that they are reasonable. Um, the, the main focus of that project was to address a big problem, which is that the, the actual criteria for making the diagnosis are highly variable um, around the world, but even within our own country, different hospitals have, have different guidelines. And so the main point of that was to come to consistency about what the tests are. 
the point I tried to make in the editorial was that, you know, you can, you can have perfect consistency um, about how you make a diagnosis. But if you don't know what it is you're trying to diagnose, it's potentially meaningless. You know, um, there has to be some underlying state that is sort of your gold standard. And then, and then it makes sense to say, okay, now what are the tests we need in order to make sure that we are um, actually diagnosing this gold standard? And the, the problem is, is that there's been great controversy about what the gold standard for brain death is. Now, is it um, that you're advocating that it, am I getting this right? It's irreversible apneic unconsciousness? Is, is that the gold standard? Is that what we're look, trying to achieve here? Well, that's what I argue. Um, uh, Why is that? Let me, let me, go, ba- let me go back and, and just say okay. a little bit about the history of this, because the big question is, is, is brain death just a different way of diagnosing traditional death? Or is it a new way of understanding what it means to be dead? And, uh, you know, going back to Henry Beecher in, in 1968, it was pretty clear that he thought this was a new understanding of what it means to be dead. That, you know, even though biological life continues, um, he believed that this is somebody who's never going to wake up. And if you're never going to wake up, then the meaning of being alive is gone. And we can consider you to be, dare I say, as good as dead, even though biological life is continuing. Now, um, 1968, we have the first paper, you know, from the Harvard committee that uh, talks about brain death. But then there's a bit of chaos because through the 1970s, some states had brain death in their laws, some didn't. And so in 1981, I believe, um, they decided we can't go on like this. And so they made a, a standard understanding of brain death. This was the, called the President's Commission at the time. and um, what they said was that, um, nope, there's only one type of death. It's biological death, just like cardiopulmonary arrest. And the reason that brain death is biological death is because when the brain dies, the body, the body needs the brain in order to maintain integrated functioning. And when the brain dies, the body literally disintegrates, falls apart, just like it does after cardiac arrest. And that was the beginning of the controversy. Um, is brain death the same as biological death, or is it a new understanding of death? Um, and you speak of this in your editorial, but I think there have been some really interesting high-profile cases over the last several years. Um, Jahai McMath, um, somebody in California who um, was declared brain dead, but continued to uh, grow and even have a menstrual period. Um, and you also speak in your article of somebody who made it through pregnancy, um, somebody who... Uh, uh, lived several years, um, other people who've lived several years. And so how has that affected um, this controversy? And was it um, were those cases the impetus for you to think about other ways of conceptualizing this? Yeah, um, we've known for, for a long time that um, if you do continue, um, I'll say life support on a patient after the diagnosis of brain death, that they can live for a long period of time. Um, Alan Schumann is the neurologist who's really carefully documented a number of these cases. But they, they were pretty much invisible because, you know, uh, as you know in your practice, once you diagnose somebody as brain dead, one of two things happens. Either the, uh, they become an organ donor or we fill out the death certificate and we take them off the ventilator. So that once that diagnosis is made, biological death almost invariably follows within a matter of hours to a couple of days. And so it was, it was not widely recognized that if you didn't stop that ventilator, that that patient might actually go on and live for a long time. And this was where the world of social media um, really changed the ball game because we had Jahai McMath, um, a young woman who has a post-operative hemorrhage uh, from, from tonsillar surgery, basically at Oakland Children's Hospital. And her family's black. And I mean, I think they were not treated well and they got angry. And so, and instead of the normal process, which is the doctors come in and say, you know, we're very sad to report, but your daughter, your daughter is, is brain dead. And now, you know, if we need to talk about organ donation or turning off the ventilator, they got a lawyer and they got legal injunctions 
And there was no doubt that she met the criteria for brain death. But long story short, New Jersey has a religious exemption for brain death. And their lawyer found a hospital in New Jersey that was willing to accept her. And so she was transferred from San Francisco to New Jersey. And not surprisingly, but people hadn't really known about this before, she went on to live for almost five more years um, until she, she succumbed to liver failure. Uh, and, you know, most of that time was not in an intensive care unit. Almost all that time she was in an apartment um, with with her mother. Uh, she had some occasional hospitalizations, but for the most part, lived like many other people with severe brain injury live uh, on a ventilator. She continued to grow. As you mentioned, she went through puberty. So very, very much looked like an otherwise living person just with a severe devastating brain injury. That's, that's fascinating. I think one of the challenges too is even how we describe it because I think technically she was dead in California. Death certificate was filled out, but alive in New Jersey. Um, and it's even weird to say like four years later, she died when from a California standpoint, she was dead, but a New Jersey standpoint, she was alive. Yeah. Very confusing. State Absolutely. lines are amazing how they do that. Yes. <laughs> but you know, that's, that's kind of the point is that if, if brain death were the same thing as biological death, we wouldn't be having this conversation. Biological death does not respect state lines. You know, if you're, if you have a cardiac arrest and, and you die, it doesn't matter what state you're in. Well, I, I think it it's also, matter. isn't it fascinating though? Like what we, do, I mean, I think part of the, the challenge that we have is, you know, in order to find death, it's, it's kind of the, the lack of life. And in order to find life, it's the, not being dead. Um, like how do we actually, and I think this is the struggle, right? Is at what point is somebody biologically dead as well? Like, is it because their heart and lungs stop beating it it, more than that? Because we can restart it. Is it the irreversibility of it? What do we define as irreversible? What if like Henrietta Lacks, her cells are still living is a part of her still alive. I think you know, it's hard. It, well, it is and it isn't. Let me say why I think it's not that hard. Is that we have a very intuitive understanding of death. I mean, if if you know we were to walk outside right now, you'd be able to point out that tree is dead. Here is an insect on the ground that's dead. We know when our pets die. And I think that there is a, a rather uniform understanding of biological death that's true across the entire biological spectrum. It's where um, an organism is, is able to oppose the entropic forces that are causing disorder using ATP and other energy consuming things in order to maintain homeostasis. And as long as that balance, that homeostatic balance is there, we would say an organism is alive. And we can talk about, you know, an amoeba, a tree, a dog, a person. When that homeostasis is gone, that's when death occurs. So, you know, I think from a biological perspective, it's actually not that complicated. But when we when we say that we're going to consider you to be the same as dead for a human being when we know you're never going to wake up or never breathe again, that's really a value choice that we've made. That's not a biological fact. We've made a value choice that that is a life that we are not going to consider anymore to be alive. Yeah, and I think what's really interesting about this is that this really didn't become a controversy until we developed the technology, you know, the ICU technology to create mechanical ventilation, dialysis, that sort of thing that keeps people alive. And I think what's so interesting is that I feel like the ethics um, of end of life technologies hasn't really caught up with um, our technology development. And I think that that's just really interesting because whenever we have these new technologies, it changes the way we think about death, it changes the way we um, make decisions around it. And, and um, just sort of talking a little bit about my area of research, it also changes like, you know, the aggressiveness of care that we have at the end and the inability to sort of think about palliative care. And so, um, yeah, I just think that's really fascinating. Yeah, you know, I think, you know, uh, one of the big controversies in, um, in end of life care, whether it's pediatric or adult, is when can we say that treatment is futile? Now, I've not been a big fan of the concept of futility in my life, but I, I, you know, there are times, and, and, and certainly in, in my world of doing intensive care medicine, um, there are times where I really believe that continued treatment is absolutely not going to work. And, and, you know, that we, a number of hospitals do have futility policies that allow the clinicians to act on that, usually with an ethics consult, and can go ahead and withdraw the ventilator without the permission of the family. Um, some places use these policies pretty routinely, 
Um, they're not that popular in, in pediatrics, but I, I mean, I don't, I don't know what your experience with them has been. But my point is that I think that brain death is somewhat similar to that. When you reach a point that a pit person is never going to wake up again, never going to breathe again, I think it does make sense to say that further treatment would be futile and treatment should be stopped. It's just that the reason for doing it isn't because they're already dead, because they're not. The reason for doing it is because further treatment is not a, is not a value, is not beneficial. So, so you argue uh, that we should have a we should go back to what Beecher proposed, which is that there's a separate conception of brain death that is distinct from biological death. And that people would have the ability to opt out of this as they have in New Jersey, which hasn't resulted in major uh, challenges. Is that is that a fair summary of your argument? As, yeah, as it, yes, it is. I mean, um, in a way, I'm not saying we should go back to what Beecher did. I, I think Beecher was simply right about what brain death is, that it's a value judgment about when we are when we can consider a person to be dead. I don't necessarily, this is a, a more complicated thing. I don't necessarily think that every patient should then have the option of, of opting out for the reason that I just said. Um, I, I don't think that it makes sense for us to keep brain dead patients in intensive care units. You know, I do, I, I think it's non beneficial treatment. And whether we, whether we say it's now a new definition of death or whether we say that the treatment is futile and we're going to stop it regardless uh, is kind of the same thing. And, and so, you know, what they've done in, in Great Britain is they've basically said, if, if you're never going to wake up and you're never going to breathe again, we are making a values-based judgment that you are dead. And in by law, we are going to treat you as if you are dead. I don't think there's anything wrong with that. I think it's just important to recognize that it's not a biological fact. It's really a value judgment that they're making. And I think that um, what's so uh, so fascinating about all of this is that it's not just a medical thing. It's not just a biological uh, sort of decision, but there's, you know, metaphysics, there's morals, there's um, religion and culture. And so I was wondering if you could speak a little bit about how those factors come into play um, in consideration of this particular um, argument that you're making and in general around um, issues of brain death. Yeah, I, I think there's been a, a lot said that, you know, brain death is accepted worldwide. I think that that is a big overstatement. So, you know, in the West, if I, if I may, I mean, you know, sort of the, the, the Western view is that we are our brains. And so if you look in North America, Western Europe, uh, brain death is widely accepted. You know, if your brain's gone, you might as well be dead. That view isn't uh, as predominant in um, in Eastern cultures, uh, where tend to have a more holistic view about what it is to be alive. And for example, in Japan, there's been a great deal of controversy about acceptance of brain death. Um, I think one of the reasons that it that brain death has made inroads um, in Eastern societies is because if you want to play a part in the world of transplantation then you need to have a way of procuring organs. And unless you're going to sort of say, it's now okay to kill people to get their organs, you're going to have to kind of buy into this notion of brain death, because it's the only way that you can really procure those organs and, and be able to, to, to tell ourselves plausibly that we did not kill the patient in doing so. They were already dead before we, before we started. And so, you know, in, in Japan and China and, and really, you know, any advanced nation, organ transplantation saves lives. I'm a huge supporter of organ organ donation, organ transplantation. But kind of if you want to have that in your society, you sort of have to also buy into the notion of brain death. And uh, the, the JAMA consensus statement, at the very end, there's an advocacy piece, it sounds like, where they, they also recommend that all countries recognize brain death and death by neurological criteria as a legal death. How do you feel about that recommendation? So, first of all... I, I did they actually say legal death? Is that is that the, the wording that's used? There? That is that is the recommendation number one under uh, BD slash DNC in the law. So brain death and death neurological criteria yeah, I mean, is recommended that all countries recognize it as a legal death. I, I'm I'm quite supportive of that actually. Um, you know, to say it's legal death is 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 I think accurate. Um, it is a legal distinction that you are as good as dead and we're going to consider you to be legally dead. What I like about that is that it, re it makes it, it implicitly recognizes that these patients are not necessarily biologically dead and, and that if support were continued, they might live for uh, some long period of time. Um, and I think that societies basically can, can choose that. Um, 
what I really like about what the UK did is that they were just so explicit about it. They, they, they just said, this is not biological death. We know it's not. But in our society, it's legal death. And, and that then becomes the foundation for uh, the ethical practice of procuring organs for transplant from these patients. Uh, I want to take a brief uh, moment to lighten the mood for a moment um, and talk about movie tie-ins. I was surfing YouTube earlier and you have this uh, magnificent uh, story that you told McLean's, McLean Center when you were a guest about uh, what happened in The Wizard of Oz. Uh, I wonder if you could tell that uh, at the beginning of The Wizard of Oz. Uh, I wonder if you could tell that story. Oh, uh, g- gosh, I wish you'd uh, give me a little prep so I could have gone back and looked at it. But you can remember that the, the house falls on the, was it, it was the Wicked Witch of the, of the West, right? And the munchkins come out and they don't know, is she really dead or not? And so they call the coroner. And he says something like, she's, you know, she's not only merely dead, she's really most sincerely dead. And uh, I think it, uh, it, it makes the point, actually, uh, you know, coroners are often not physicians, um, but it, it's we're a person of authority. We, we need a person of authority to come out and say, yes, this is really death or it's really legal death, at least. Right. And that's the role that the coroner played in the, in the Wizard of Oz. Yeah. Right. It gets to this issue of why is this so important? Like, why is this moment of transition to death, some sort of death, so important to us? And it also gets at my question to you, Bob, like you've been, I remember you advocated for this proposal, this idea when we met several years ago, why isn't it policy? Why isn't it law in the United States? What are the forces, the countervailing forces behind this, uh, this move? Well, I can only speculate, but, uh, you know, we are a very polarized society right now. I think there's a fear that to openly acknowledge that brain death is not biological death, it becomes a crack in the door for, you know, some version of a pro-life argument that if it's not biological death, they're not really dead. And if you take out their organs, you're killing them. And I think that I think that people have a, a great deal of fear about that. That being said, you know, um, we we do know that New Jersey has basically allowed people to opt out of brain death for for over 25 years, and we haven't seen any sort of a movement like that in New Jersey. Of course, New Jersey is New Jersey, and you know how would it play in in other states? I don't know. But you know, this is where I think I really have concerns about obfuscating the facts in order to promote good policy. I agree. I, I, you know, I, I want to see people feel confident in the organ transplantation system. I want them to, to know that we're not going to kill people for their organs. Um, at, at the same time, I think we want to be honest about what brain death means. And I think to say that, oh, when you're brain dead, you're biologically dead, is, is, it's simply not true. So, you know, wh- where do you find that balance between promoting good public policy and telling the truth? And this is a very complicated um, topic. Um, I mean, for people who are, you know, experts like you in the area, but also for doctors and then for the general public. And so actually, I'm I'm just curious, how do we even garner that understanding of what the public opinion is, be that of, you know, clinicians or of the general public? Like, how how do you get a sense of even what people want or prefer? Well, there's been some good sociological research done on this. Michael Nair Collins is a, a sociologist who's done a lot of it. And just to, to really summarize his work in just a sentence, it turns out that for about 70% of people, if you, if you present them with a patient who's on a ventilator, never going to wake up, never going to breathe on their own, is it okay to donate their organs? Is it okay for the doctors to, re- to remove the organs? Would you allow your organs to be removed if you were like that? About 70% of people say yes, and it has nothing to do with whether the patient is dead. And for about 30%, it matters a lot as to whether the patient is already dead. You know, what do you do with that information? I think if if 30% of our population were really upset about what I would say is the fact of what brain death means, um, I can understand why people are concerned about speaking the truth. And can we go to kind of uh, the 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 target, like when we're saying brain death, what are we actually saying? Yeah, I um, th- thanks for the question because I I do think it's actually very clear and and um, I think there's advantages to recognizing what it is. It's it is a state of irreversible 
apneic, unconsciousness. Can we just describe why all three of those are important? I get the irreversibility. <laughs> so making sure that there's not something that could be fixed, some reason, like they're really hypothermic, um, that there's a diagnosis that's consistent with it, right? That's what we're looking for. That's right. And irreversibility is, is, is always a, a tenuous claim because as soon as you have one case that isn't irreversible, then you've sort of blown the whole thing out of the water. Um, so we sort of make assumptions about irreversibility, um, and I'm comfortable with it. I mean, I think that the, the injury that these patients have is, is very severe, and, I, and some concerns have been raised. I mean, neurologist Alan Schumann really believes that Jahai McMath had recovered to a minimally conscious state at one point. I, he may be right. I don't know. He's pretty convinced he was right about that. Uh, and that would sort of disprove the reversibility uh, hypothesis in the way we diagnose uh, brain death. Unconsciousness, um, you know, I think it's interesting. We don't, we don't do very sophisticated testing for the lack of consciousness. Mostly the part of the brain death exam is, is, is nothing more sophisticated than pressing on the sternum or, or pressing on the nail bed and seeing if the patient responds. We know that uh, behavioral testing for unconsciousness is very unreliable. Patients who have been diagnosed as being in a permanent vegetative state, for example, purely on the basis of the behavioral exam, um, we now know that those diagnoses can be wrong about 40% of the time. And if you actually put those patients in fMRI machines, um, a significant number of them will show signs of consciousness, even though they can't demonstrate it behaviorally at all. So I think there's, there's, there's room to bolster the claim that patients who meet brain death criteria are absolutely irreversibly unconscious. The, the part about apnea, um, you know, you could say, well, why, why does it matter if you breathe or not? Yeah. Um, if you, you know, that was my um, question. Why is yeah. apnea? <laughs> well, you know, patients who are in a PVS, we, we, uh, they very often, we, we consider them to be irreversibly unconscious, but breathing. And the notion that the notion that somebody who's breathing is actually dead, I think just runs counter to very, very deep psychological intuitions that we have. Um, that probably go back, you know, thousands of years in our, in our thinking. So, I think that's more of just a, almost a social thing that um, you, you can't be breathing and be dead. And so I think that that's where the apnea requirement comes, comes, comes into play. Yeah, I think of the early medieval definitions of death, you know, hold a mirror up to the face and see if it fogs. I think also of the um, the caskets that have the pull mechanism so you yes. can trigger a flag so that somebody above knows that they're not dead, they're alive. <laughs> I also think I want to interject another movie reference because this is fun and there are so many good movie references. Princess Bride, he's not dead. He's mostly dead. <laughs> There's a big right. difference between dead and mostly dead. Um, Famous quote, yes. yes. I did have a question, which I've forgotten with the Princess Bride, but Liz, looks like you've got one. Oh, I was just going to say that, um, again, with mechanical ventilation, though, that's made it much more difficult for us to have that sort of very inherent uh, gut notion that this person is dead. And I mean, I remember um, situations in, in residency, for example, where there was actually a lot of challenge in determining whether or not they were actually apneic um, because there was all the mechanical ven ventilation, and all the other technologies complicating it. Yeah. And, you know, um, even our intuition that if you're breathing, you're alive. And if you're not breathing, maybe you're dead. I mean, you look at, you know, the famous example of Christopher Reeve, Superman with his cervical quadriplegia. He couldn't breathe, um, just like a brain dead patient can't breathe. And yet no one would doubt that he was alive, right? So so the, the correlations between breathing and being alive or being dead are, are imperfect at best. But nevertheless, um, you know, I think that that has been one of the hallmarks of the diagnosis of brain death that I think would be very difficult to get rid of. And can I ask another hallmark that we often see the brainstem reflexes? Because how does that fit in? Why are they so important? Great question. And um, I think there's a good answer for it. Yeah, if you've, if, you know, if you've been at the bedside when, when, we do the neuro, when we do the neurological exam, we do these brainstem reflex testing very, very carefully. We get, I mean, like, for example, for the pupillary reflex, we, we have these... Uh, devices now that can detect microscopic constriction of the pupils. And so um, we're very, very meticulous about that. And yet you might ask, why are we doing that? Um, I mean, people can live just fine if their pupils don't constrict. 
um, you know, you don't need those brainstem reflexes in order to do activities of daily living. And the reason that we do that is because there's a structure in the brainstem called the reticular activating system, which is responsible for wake wakefulness. And it's, it, for example, for patients in a PVS, it is still active and that's why they have sleep wake cycles. We can't actually test that. There's no, there's no way of testing that. But the, the RAS is surrounded by these brainstem nuclei. And so by testing for those brainstem reflexes and knowing that they are gone, we infer, therefore, that the RAS is also non-functional. And if the RAS is non-functional, then by definition, the patient cannot be conscious. So it's a, it's a supplementary way, in addition to pressing on the sternum, pressing on the nail beds, it's a supplementary way of knowing that this patient really is unconscious. I've got a couple more questions. First one, um, what would we call this term that is distinguished from uh, biological death? Would we call it brain death and call it separate? Or would we call it irreversible apneic state? And would that provide comfort to families who uh, want that there 30% of individuals who are uncomfortable um, removing life-sustaining treatment from a person who is in such a state without knowing that they are dead? Yeah, I, you know, um, I think the, the most accurate way to put it is that when we do the testing, we determine to a high degree of probability that this person is in a state of irreversible apneic unconsciousness. And that in our country, we have a law which says that if you are in this state, you are legally dead. I think that that's the most accurate way of putting it. Um, when I make the diagnosis of brain death, I mean, you know, I work in pediatric intensive care. Mm -hmm. um, I do say to, this is what I tell parents, um, that their child is never going to wake up again, that they're never going to breathe again. And in Massachusetts, under the law, their child is legally dead. Uh, it does get to that point, dead. They're legally dead. And this raises another um, key question, which is statewide variation. And my question is, you know, looking at the United States at this time, uh, what proportion of states or um, are there just a few that currently recognize irreversible apneic unconsciousness as legally dead? Uh, in other words, which, which states are uh, already on board with this proposal? And you mentioned earlier that there, there should in the future be some federal policy. Do we need to drive towards statewide change first or should this be a top-down approach from the federal government? Well, first of all, all 50 states recognize irreversible apneic unconsciousness as legal death. All 50 states. Um, the only um, difference is the degree to which they allow families to disagree that that is really death. So New Jersey is the only one that has a, a true religious exemption. Um, New York, I believe California, uh, have softer language that, you know, you should... Uh, provide accommodation for religious beliefs, which usually means just delaying it, just delaying the diagnosis a little bit longer. Um, New Jersey is really the only one that allows you to opt out. So are we there or what are these legal challenges about then? So the legal challenges are twofold. Um, one is if it's not really biological death, is the law legitimate? So that's, that's one. The other that we haven't really talked about is that the, the actual law on brain death in the United States requires, I'll quote, the complete absence of all functions of the entire brain, including the brainstem. That's the law. If you look at the testing that we do for brain death, it only tests certain functions. And in particular, we now know that there are patients who do retain hypothalamic functioning namely things like temperature control and, uh, and uh, regulation of vasopressin secretion, um, which you could argue are pretty important brain functions. You know, you, you need your brain to, to regulate your temperature and to regulate your fluid balance. And they are not tested. They are not part of the brain death testing. And yet some patients do retain them. And so Jahai McMath here, was one, right? And Jahai McMath was certainly one, right? And, um, and so here's the paradox is that you can, you can, you can completely fulfill the American Academy of Neurology criteria for brain death and not fulfill the law, which requires the complete absence of all functions of the entire brain. I think that that's actually the biggest vulnerability that our law has right now. And um, 
Uh, increasingly, we're seeing a number of legal scholars recognize that this is a big vulnerability. The tests that we use don't actually meet the requirements of the law. And so we are going to have to go back and revisit the law in some way and fix that, that, that inconsistency. The good news is we have a well-functioning government that can easily tackle difficult <laughs> issues like this. Um, yes. <laughs> uh, but uh, less cynically, the good news is actually that the, the, uh, there's an organization in Washington called the, the Uniform Commission or State Commissioners or something like this that, that do develop these uniform state laws. And they, my understanding is that they have agreed to reconsider our brain death law specifically to address these problems. Mm -hmm. So we'll see how that goes. Right. It, it, it strikes me that there is generally um, strong, uh, you know, you asked before about this question of, uh, you know, 30% of people would be uncomfortable um, removing life sustaining treatment um, from persons unless they were declared dead in some way. And I, I guess one of the key drivers, as you mentioned, and this goes back historically to 1967, is transplant. Yes. And of course, and I, I suspect there's broad uh, agreement about the importance of transplant um, within the United States and around the world, as you mentioned. Um, my question is, you know, and of course we want to do transplant for really compelling reasons, right? Because we can save lives of people um, who would otherwise die. Is there also a financial reason? Is there, are there financial, I mean, transplant is big money, right? Are, are there big money drivers uh, that have a vested interest in changing this definition? Well, I, I'm actually a, a little less cynical than you are. I mean, I, I think that, yes, of course, transplant is big money, but transplant also saves a lot of lives. But here's, here's the question that occurs to me, is that, you know, we are uh, fairly well advanced at using CRISPR technology to edit pig genomes in order to overcome the immunological barriers to using and, and infectious disease barriers to using pig organs for transplantation. Let's fast forward five to 10 years, and let's say that we can use pig organs, and they're the perfect size, and they're in virtually unlimited supply. And now the ethics of, of you know, using these organs is, is really not much different than the ethics of whether you eat bacon. And we suddenly no longer need organs from people. Will we even need a concept of brain death? I have this vision that, you know, you'll get Harrison's textbook of medicine in 20 years and you go to the index and you won't even find it wow. because it was it was a social construction that for a particular historical time where we needed to get organs from people. And when the need for that is gone, the need, I think, for the concept will be gone. And then we'll be back to what, you know, uh, we do every day, which is to talk with families about what's the prognosis and does it make sense to continue with life support? And, you know, and for, for people that are never going to wake up again and those sorts of things, um, we're going to say it's time to withdraw the ventilator, just like we do now. But we won't need to, we won't need to have this, this social construct that we call brain death. And there'll probably be a greater proportion of people that are being kept alive in a irreversible, unconscious, apneic state. Maybe so, maybe a few more. But, you know, um, my experience is that most families don't want to keep their loved one alive in that state any more than you or I probably would. Yeah. Um, there will be some. There will be the Jahai McMath. Although even Jahai McMath's mother said that if she'd been treated differently, she wouldn't have insisted on continuing the ventilator. Yeah. So, you know, e e even there. Um, communication. I'm not sure. <laughs> yes, right. exactly. Really good communication, the importance of it. Well, Bob, I want to thank you for joining us uh, for today's podcast and taking the time. I thought this was absolutely fascinating. I I learned a lot. Um, we will have links to all your articles, including um, there's a... You mentioned a Hastings, uh, Hastings website. Center report. Yeah, Hastings Center yeah, if, report. If you uh, if you Google Wiley W I L E Y, which is the publisher, and then um, Brain Death Hastings Center report, you'll you'll get the whole volume. It's open access. Um, Great, and, and we'll have links to that articles. too. Um, Great. So okay. we'll have links to all of this. But before we leave, Alex, do you want to give us a little bit more for the dead heads out there? Gray. On the hand it fits There's really nothing much to it Whistle to your teeth and spit Cause it's alright Oh well, a touch of grace 
It kind of suits you anyway That was all I had to say And it's all right I will get by I will get by, I will survive, we will get by, we will get by. I think you're even better than the Grateful Dead. <laughs> <laughs> That's a great song for this podcast. Also a great song for 2020. Um, Bob, a big thank you again for joining us. Thanks for the opportunity. Really appreciate it. And Liz, thank always you, great to have you on. It's great to be here. <laughs> A big thank you to Artstone Foundation for your continued support for the Jerry Powell Podcast. And to all of our listeners, if you have a moment, please share this uh, podcast and others on your favorite social media app. Send out that tweet. Good night, Thanks, folks. <laughs>